Okay, we're back. Sorry guys, I had to restart the stream real quick. I couldn't, it wasn't, I knew OBS was, <laughs> it was too easy for a second there. Uh, it wouldn't let me find where the, like under my docks, it wouldn't let me access the chat, so. And I need that up. Anyways, I hope you guys are doing well today. What I was saying in the other video, which I've now deleted, obvious reasons, is we are going to start with participation questions, and then we're going to move on to the animation of your your monarch butterflies. And with that animation, I'm basically going to give you guys some guidance on how you will be putting the scenes together as far as animation goes. And then you will take what you learn and you'll apply it to your assets that you create and you will successfully put together a video. Hopefully we'll get to the transition stuff. If we don't, I'll just direct you to some videos that you can watch that will show you a little bit more about it or I will talk about how you will go about doing that. So let's go ahead and get started right away with our participation questions. We have Asia here. Hello. Um, for my question this week, I was wondering, since we've been playing a lot around with squash and stretch and like just figuring out what works best in the moment, I was wondering if in like animation job wise, if a lot of it is like purely technical and there are certain techniques, um, or if the majority of animation is kind of just like playing around and like seeing what works for what specifically you're animating with. Thank you. That's a really good question. You will always apply your, you should always apply your 12 principles of animation to whatever video you're doing for clients or for your job specifically. Different jobs will have different necessities. And what I mean by that, for example, in my, some of the videos that I do, like I said, in classes before I work a lot with medical clients and they're not specifically focused necessarily on exaggeration and like really squashed and stretched objects or very cartoony things they're more looking for a video to convey information some of them some of the videos that I do will have all of that, all of the 12 principles of animation. And you can still apply the principles of animation to those videos that are more serious and less, uh, I guess I would say creative, more or less or less exaggerated. I'll say that because you should always find creativity in no matter what kind of video you do. It can be hard, but that's a whole other thing. And some So some you'll apply, some you won't apply, and then you'll find out as you are continue working where things fit in. You will, you will, you should always know though the 12 principles of animation. You should just know them and understand how they work so that you can, you can improve your work and the things that you'll experiment on. Sometimes you'll have clients that will want new material or they'll want something to look a, a very, like a specific style. And then you will have to do your research and find out how to do certain things or different techniques. And that's where you'll get a little bit of wiggle room to experiment with different effects and different styles, so on and so forth. But most of the time that will be done within your personal work that you work on your own time. Unless you're working for a specific studio or for a company that does certain certain things. But most of the time when you're experimenting, you're doing that on your own, on your own accord. And so technically, the this is why we teach you the technicalities of animation is so that you can apply them to your job when you actually go get one. Because most of the time they're going to just look at, can you do what you do? And and there will be companies that will hire you based off of your aesthetic. But it takes a while to build to that point. It takes a while to get to the, to the, to the point in time in your career where you have 
where people are hiring you solely based on your style, but it takes a lot of personal work to get there and that experimentation, right? And so the biggest thing that you want to do inside of your portfolio, and it takes a while to build this up, is to have that personal work in there. The, the type of work that you want to do is what you put in your portfolio. If you're just looking for a job, put in there what you're what is going to apply to the job. So if you're applying to a job that is a video editing job, you're not going to put animation, you're not going to put 3D animated or 2D animated things in there. You're going to specifically make a reel that has video edits in it. Same thing for animation. If you have edited videos, unless there's animation in it, you're not going to put it into that reel. And so that's kind of the summary of of your question there but it was a really good question and I appreciate it Asia and then Sarah I see you're in the chat uh so how are you doing today we can yeah that's yeah the fig the videos you know you get you get busy I understand that kind of stuff you've been very consistent though so um but let's go to Brennan Hi, I was just wondering if anyone knew a easier way to get all of the um, Cinema 4D assets, like the materials and stuff that come with the program, because all of these are missing for me, and I want to try and avoid having to reinstall everything. So um, if anyone knows, like, I don't know if there's a URL with all the assets that you can download um, everything from, or because I tried moving it over from an older version with this, but it didn't work, so I'm just not sure. Uh, if there's an easier way other than reinstalling the whole program and all the assets and everything. Yeah, the library, Brandon, that's a tough one because the library should automatically have that in there. And what I'm realizing is that all of your videos are, or all of your materials, I'm sorry, are Redshift render materials. And what I'm, how you can tell is that it has this little red, uh, octave what is that a pentagon hexagon it's not an octagon there's one two three four five six sides what is that a sectagon gosh it's been a long time since i've done like a geometry class and that's funny i don't know i never work with those but either way that's what i'm noticing while you click through there is all of them are redshift materials so there might be some kind of filter happening inside of your inside of your program, I would double check under your view because there's no filter option here. Um, I would also look in your standard and standard and physical renders, right? Because these ones aren't going to render out property for you, even if you had it, because you have to render it with the Redshift renderer, which is specific to these, well, these materials are specific to that rendering engine. So I would try and look in here. If you're, are you searching up here? This is something else I want to know is if you're typing anything in the search bar. I would also click here to see if there's like an option for a filter area there. So we'll, let's get down to that because I, I definitely know you need to be putting materials on your objects. Uh, the other thing you can do is watch the past videos I did not on Tuesday, but uh, I believe it was last Tuesday or the Thursday's class, last week's classes. You can rewatch those, and I talk about creating a standard material and then also creating a physically based renderer material, which you can watch and learn how to do that, and that way you can create your own materials for, for these projects in particular. But uh, we'll try and figure that out for you because that is not a normal thing. All right, let's go to the next question. I am doing okay, Sarah, for your question in the chat. I have had a busy day. Hey, uh, <laughs> real quick question this week, just about the deliverables here for the Principles of Motion Design and 3D assignment. Uh, I was just curious if you wanted us to uh, still comment on five other people's posts uh, in Slack. If so, that's fine. Um, I just, I know some of the stuff in the uh, in that canvas page was a bit outdated uh, so I was curious if that was still part of the assignment here and if so uh, do you want us to just comment and that's it or do you want us to you know take screenshots and uh, make a board and then submit that as a separate file 
that's yeah, that's part of the assignment. Um, and that's it for this group. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Brian. Um, so not everyone's assignments because everyone's been turning their assignments in at different times, right? So there's not necessarily, there weren't at that moment five videos that you could comment on. So just go in there and drop a couple comments on there. You don't have to. I appreciate the option of taking screenshots and posting them into Miro. You don't have to do that. I've already went through and graded the, the assignments. I saw people were putting in comments on them. The The point of that is to get used to really giving people constructive criticism as well, or just letting people know what you specifically like about their videos. That's a, it's unfortunately something you guys don't get to experience firsthand because we're on online and live online class, which is unfortunate because part of, part of being an animator or just anyone in the creative field is, is getting feedback, constructive criticism, and also hearing what you've done well about your work. And so that's why we really, I really encourage you guys to, you know, talk about what you actually like inside of someone else's projects. And if you're wondering what they did, ask how they did it, because that's, you know, that'll carry on throughout your career. And there are people who I will watch tutorials online and I'll ask them you know, I'll slide into their DMs and I'm like, hey, how'd you do that? I'm really interested. Could you make a tutorial or could you do this? Or how did you pull off that technique? You know, there's different things. Everyone in this, in the, des the design community, the animation community are very friendly. And so that's the, that's the good thing about this, this career is everyone's usually willing to share information with you. You will find some people do not do that, but that's really the point of the Slack. The Slack comments are to get you used to commenting on other people's work, looking at other people's work, starting to dissect other people's work, and then commenting on there, right? I don't want you going in there and be like, wow, your stuff sucks, because that's not constructive. That's just mean. <laughs> And that's, you know, but I want you to go in there and be like, hey, maybe if there's constructive criticism, you could be like, I like this thing about your video. I like that you did this about your video. Here's where I could see improvements or here's maybe have you thought about doing this, right? And so that's the point of the Slack section of that deliverable. For me, mostly, I am more focused on you guys following through with the actual animations of it and that your animations look appropriate for what you guys learned, right? So, uh, but good question, Brian. Zoe. In fact, um, let me say this, Brian. I had noticed that, I don't want to forget to let you guys know, but I had forgotten to update this, um, this specific assignment that we're working on and give you guys the information of deliverables that you guys are going to be turning in and so what I did is I updated this for you here so I'll go through that in a little bit but but yes good question Zoe okay, so I have a question um when I submit this it's already going to be too late but here's okay. my question um so I have this uh file that I need to render and um, I thought that my render settings are good. I looked at them, I checked them, I thought they were good. Maybe they're not. Maybe that's the problem. But when I go to render, I get this, um, error message. Files cannot be written. Please check out output paths. Um, I don't know what an output path is, to be honest. Um, I don't know if I messed up my files. I think I've done that before, where I just mess up my files or I delete something and it messes it all up so yeah um that's my question I will hopefully figure this out sometime but maybe I can get a better explanation on what I did wrong so yeah Thank um you. it looks like yeah I some of the naming conventions and the technical terms that you see in these error, co error codes that you get from 
software are really confusing. I don't know why they do that. They speak, it's like reading language for robotics and I just, I don't understand. And so a lot of the times what I end up doing is I copy that, that specific error and then I paste it into Google or I'll retype exactly what it says into Google and then check on Reddit or see if someone's, you know, created a video on how to fix it or any kind of issues. I believe that when you were going through, it could have done, it looks like, I don't know why. Let me just kind of click through here. If you go under save, you know, I don't think you had gone under your save tab. But from what I'm gathering, it didn't have a path to put your rendered images in, which means uh, you didn't direct it to a specific folder. That's what my assumption is of the error code that you got. And so next time, if that happens, go into your, under your render, render settings where you are now, go on to your save and check to see where the location is there. I You must have figured it out because you turn this in because I obviously remember talking about this in class and you did a good job. Uh, but yes, I understand how frustrating that is. And then if you guys, you know, you guys, if you end up having issues like this that are inhibiting you from rendering out your video and submitting it, you don't have to save these for participation questions. If you're going through and it's it's becoming an issue, you can just type it into Slack and I'll do my best to answer it as soon as possible. And if other students see the question and, and go ahead and answer it first, then that's also clearly acceptable on my end, you know. So if, if that ever becomes a problem again, Zoe, and you're feeling like that pressure, like, oh, gosh, I got to get it turned in, then just go ahead and throw it into Slack. I want you guys to get used to using Slack specifically. Like I said, it's very similar to Discord because right now a lot of companies are, if you work remotely, my day job, I use Slack every single day. For this, I use it for, I used it for freelancing. I also used it for, um, you know, I use it for my day job, I use it for freelancing, and I, I use it for school and for teaching. So it is a very powerful communication tool, and you can always take a quick video like you did here and just throw it in there, and then we'll get that answered as quickly as possible. And, you know, if it's so close to the, you know, and then you can either save, um, you don't have to save... What was I going to say? Then instead of that question for your participation grade, what you can do is you can walk us through possibly what went wrong and how you got that question answered, right? I would accept I would accept a participation video like that as well because you've already gone through and done the whole the whole question thing, right? But it looks like you figured it out. Let me know if you still had any issues with that and then I'll help you with that, Zoe, okay? But good job overall. Uh, Lee. Looking at the at the next project we have this um, this butterfly thing. Looking at this map of North America, do we do we have to use this exact same map, or can we just use like any certain one that we that we find? Actually, Lee, the I also posted in there into our module. Another map, it has to be of North America. It can't be of anywhere else specifically because the voiceover in this animation talks about the migration pattern of of monarch butterflies. And that's why, you know, that's why these, these illustrations are so specific. And you'll come across that often. You're going to have someone who's like, I need this specific illustration done. So... It does have to be of North America. It can't just be of any map. What I also did is I added in here on, so that one that you were looking at is a PNG file, which means that you can open it up, but it's not going to be editable as far as layers go. And I also added for this class specifically this one right here, which is an Illustrator file. And I'm going to go over a little bit more how to update that and stuff when we get to, before we start the animation today. Uh, because I have I have a stock account. I had downloaded it off of a stock account 
and licensed it for you guys to use so that you can customize this a little bit more. And so we'll go over how to customize that here in just a little bit, but you don't necessarily have to use that one specifically, no. And then if you want to hand illustrate North America, you can do that, but it's going to take a long time because North America is, it's, it's a big and complex, complex map, right? So I would suggest just using that. And then if you want to though, and you have the time, you can absolutely illustrate your own or find a different one. All right, Kaylee. Hi, so my question this week is about the revisions. You've mentioned how it's coming up soon and I wanted to try and get a head start on it. Um, I'm basically wondering when it does come up, is it basically going to be like all of it's due at once or is it going to be like, oh, the very first project that we worked on, this revision will be due this day, and then the second project, the revision will be due this day, like separate, or is it going to be like all together one big thing? Good question, Kaylee. That, that, that's a legit question to ask about that project. It is going to be all of the revisions will be due at one time. And so it is better if you get, it's not going to be until after spring break, right? So if you want to take some time over spring break to work on that. And then, like I said, I might be a little limited in the, in the area of, of time for questions or be limited on how quickly I respond. But I will at some point respond to you guys with questions in either Slack or um, Canvas where you you guys are like because you'll probably want to take some time over spring break to update those things unless you start ahead of time right now if you start going through the past projects and making those updates sooner rather than later you're going to make less work for yourself in the long run and you know there's some some of you have more updates to work on than others and there's you guys might not nail it on the second time around. There might you you might still have more revisions that I'd tell you to do later or let you know how to improve your your project more, right? Because I know that I know that some of the feedback you re you guys receive is heavier feedback. You guys have you'll have several things to change and then some videos you'll only have a couple things to change. So it's a little bit different, but the nice thing is that you guys are stacking your knowledge, right? And you guys are learning those principles of animation because of the last two projects that you'll be able to apply those to the past projects more. And so I think that the revision round will include up to this one, possibly, the butterfly. I want you guys to, you know, start working on this one sooner rather than later. So I'll kind of decide which few projects I want in there, but it will be, um, it, it will be a decent amount of work combined all together. It will probably be the amount of work as one single project. And that's why it is its own project in, in and of itself. But if you need more clarification on that, Kaylee, let me know and we can talk a little bit more about that. Okay. But let's go to Lee. There you go. What color you want? Okay, Lee, I can't hear you in this video, but uh, I hear your music. No, no, just, just normal. No, no, yeah, no. Yeah, Lee, if you want to just, um, you can let me know. <laughs> that makes me laugh. I'm sorry. I had to stop it, though, because I don't know if the video, it's not like this video is monetized or anything, but I just don't want it to be copy story. I don't want any kind of issue with that. So I have to stop playing that one. But um, if you go ahead and just ask your question, because obviously I see you there asking a question, you're pretty good at submitting them weekly. So just let me know what your question was inside of Canvas, or you can email me or Slack me directly. And, and I'll answer that question for you. <laughs> but just make sure next time you're not playing because Inside, let me bring this over so I can show you guys. And it's going to look like Inception right now, so forgive me. Don't pay attention to this. But down here, if it says desktop audio, if you're playing anything in the background or on your computer, like music, a video, anything like that, Discord, you know, just anything else that's producing audio, it will pick that up. So all you have to do is just 
hit mute right there or just click on that and then just mute that thing. Or you can just remove this completely from your source and then just collect the audio from your microphone. Unless you're working, unless you want me to hear something, right? Like this week we are working in... This week we're working with audio, and so if you're having an issue with your audio and you want me to hear it, you will want to have that desktop audio on. So just be conscious of that, and OBS gets, yeah, it takes a little bit to get used to, but just so you guys know. All right, we're going to go to Nolan. So my question for this week, um, I'm just pretty curious about this. So in... Um, in After Effects, when we put in the three different um, animations, uh, I, I clicked on the blur thing, just like for fun, just to see if it would do anything. Oh, it's not even on the right one. And it like doesn't. So I'm curious, uh, does it work if it's something from the outside? Or is it just for stuff you make in After Effects? Or like if you can use that. So I'm just kind of curious about that. Yeah, you can, it's it's more for things that you make inside of After Effects and for layers that you have animating inside of After Effects because what it does is it takes the, the mathematical information that's produced from the movement, right? Because essentially the motion inside of After Effects is all based on a mathematical point in space where it's moving it from one thing to another thing. So it's either subtracting, addition, I don't know, I do, I'm, First of all, terrible at math. Second of all, I am do not know an, enough about coding or software development to like give you any kind of solid answer on that. But it's basically taking that information and then um, multiplying and turning down the transparency on each iteration as it goes by. So that's why you don't actually see it when you turn on the motion blur on a layer of a video that's already rendered. Now, if you were to add blur on top of it using Gaussian blur, like an effect, and you were to throw that on top of the layer, it would blur that that video, that rendered video, but it's you're not gonna be able to blur it. Um, you're not gonna be able to pick and choose where the blur is, right? It's just going to go over the entire thing. And then you would, what would happen is mask it. You would have to mask things out. It would be way more work than it's even worth. And so I'm not sure there, you know, there's obvious ways to work with, there's got to be ways to work with blur in Cinema 4D, but really there's no blur on there right now because of the render, the render engine that we're working in. It, as soon as you start stacking stuff like that inside of Cinema 4D, including materials, right? If you're using materials that don't work with the render, the render engine that you're rendering the video from like it's just gonna take your computer's not it's just not gonna work right so for instance if you were to add if you were working in the physical renderer or the viewport renderer and you started adding all this stuff onto it that doesn't necessarily work well with that render engine then it is just going to not show up and then if we were to use a different render engine, this is the reason we use the viewport in the physical or the standard render render engine is because they're the lowest resolute, like they're the lowest tier of their render engines that work well with most of your machines because not, not everyone can afford to be using a very like a, a really powerful machine or working off a powerful computer. And so if I were to make you guys start rendering things in different render engines, like the Redshift Render, those, there's like classes specifically on those because it's so in-depth. And, and you guys just would never, nothing would get done. You guys would be rendering that. If you guys started rendering something on Monday, it'd still be rendering right now. And there's just a lot of components and different factors that go into different render engines. And so that's just part of the reason that we don't add those type of things onto our videos at the moment. And then as you as you get more into the more into the profession or you start 
taking classes in person because I know that they recently upgraded the computers that are inside the HT1 lab and inside the specific classroom that we teach animation in. Those are going to be able to handle more. They're, they're, they're powerful machines versus like a laptop right because laptops are limited in what they can do unless you have like a really expensive gaming laptop and I, it's just I understand everyone's ability you know there I mean I wasn't able to build a PC until I was in my career and had saved up the money to build one an appropriate one so there it takes time to get to that point but yeah, that's part of the reason, I mean, I kind of went on a little tangent there, but that is just all in all, you can't really add the blur into those 3D videos like you would in inside of After Effects. So uh, next question though, good question, Nolan, um, Amaya. So this is progress for this week and it has been crazy nonetheless, I, lost track of time with other things and that is why I am recording this in mode. Oh shit. Uh, it looks like we had some technical difficulties there, Maya. So um let me know what your question is and we'll answer that, right? Let's see here, Janelle. It looks like maybe your thing cut off or something happened, but make sure that if that happens, you guys are resubmitting the appropriate video. Janelle. Hello. So my um, question for this week is I made this sign in Cinema 4D and then imported it into Unity, and the N is not loading in. I've tried it. I've tried to import it a few different times, and it's just not loading it and I'm not sure why um so yeah thank you you know what I don't really work in unity so much so I'm not quite sure specifically that question it is a good question it should load in it looks like the rest of the it doesn't look like it's a material issue because the rest of it is loading in are you having any are you having any issues when you look at it in Cinema 4D at all, Janelle? I'd be curious about that. And then um, what we can do is if you're working in Unity, if you're in any other animation or or 3D design classes, if you're taking anything with Casey Farina, I would specifically ask him this question because he works in Unity often, and I do not work in Unity. Um, I will be at some point. Obviously, I want to learn that, but... I don't know. I don't know if it could be the the angle of it or like the if there's like some kind of weird reflection. It could just be a an issue with some kind of like the the linking that's happening between the files. So maybe what you should try and do first is to delete the imported object and then re import it into unity i would try that always try that kind of stuff first because sometimes the simplest the simplest solution is is what it is the simplest the most obvious answer is is what it is and just sometimes it happens that way sometimes you know software will will give us issues and you just kind of have to restart it and, and start it again sometimes you have to try and save one file like copy a file and just open it up and save it with a different like a number at the end of it there's just a lot of things that can go wrong when you're linking software linking files into different software and stuff so I would try that first try try re-importing it into unity try rendering this out to see if you have an issue with the render because then that way like if you just look at it in a quick render, you you only have to really re render one frame, right? And if it's looking okay there, then it should essentially be switching over to Unity. But that's a great way to troubleshoot it, right? Like if you render that, that frame out and you're looking at it and it looks okay, then obviously it's not something that is happening inside of Cin Cinema 4D. It must be either happening inside of Unity or between the linking of the files. So try that. Let me know if you figure it out. If not, let's ask Casey and we'll figure that out for you. 
All right, Yvette. Hello, this is Yvette. Um, I'm doing this participation for the Principle of Ocean for the Cinema 4D. And um, one thing that I struggled and uh, figured out at the end was the text, the 3D text and stuff. Um, when I was watching the videos, I couldn't figure out where to find the 3D text because um, when I press on the text button, it would uh, just give me the 2D version instead of 3D. So I was pretty stuck, but I ended up figuring out, as you can see, um, apparently you have to click and drag to see everything under, on, uh, under the list of, you know, for the text and uh, whatnot. So that was both a challenge, it was really struggled, but I ended up figuring out, so it was a relief at the end. Um, I think over... Yeah, quick note on that. Um, I'm happy you figured it out. It, and a lot of these programs have their tools or their objects. There's multiple under each little icon. It's similar to like if you work in Photoshop or Illustrator and you know that on the side toolbar, like let's say in Illustrate here is a great, great, I can just pull it up right here because I have it ready. But inside Illustrator, there are these tools, but it has this little triangle there alluding to, hey, there's more, and you just kind of have to hold, and then you can go down that way. And a lot of um, a lot of creative programs are like that, so that's like a great way to, that's a great thing to check right, right away if you're having trouble finding, because yes, initially, if you just hit the text button in Cinema 4D, it just creates a text spline tool, and it doesn't create an actual text object with a dim with dimension to it um but yeah that's a great uh great observation there a great question is you got to click and hold down so let's go Overall, to the rest of it. my favorite part of this project was the 2d not today the cartoon ball here i i loved how squishy and like it looks like slime and stuff it was really fun to play with that and I like how you get to pick the colors for yourself and all that. And uh, I also like this cube. I like stretching it and stuff, so it was very nice. It was like, made it look a lot real. I don't know why, for some reason, it didn't come out as a full uh, dice. It's your, it's your viewport render, it, or you have to you hit the see, N, A. Has, like, the holes and stuff. So I'm not sure how, I, how to really fix that, but... Um, I did end up doing the animation, so that's another thing I struggled with, and I don't know. But um, overall, it was very fun. Um, for ideas, um, I saw this project as kind of like similar to what YouTubers would do for their intros or outros, is they have their name and then something happened, animating something in the background, which is also nice. So that's that's a that's some ideas I got from this. Yeah. Um, you also see a lot of those, like, um, if you look or if you, if you, if you're on Instagram and you're following 3D animation and stuff, you'll see a lot of people who, you know, they'll do the videos that are satisfying videos. And so they'll create a CD or a 3D scene that continuously repeats and it's just looping over and over and the same action happens but you find yourself watching it 10 times because you're just watching everything over and over and over again. Um, and so this is a great way to learn how to do that, right? You learned how to loop things, you learned how to animate things, rotation, position, scale inside of Cinema 4D. Um, and so you can apply that essentially and do that and do something like that and make your own YouTube bumper for your own channel, right? So a great way to think about that. Also then, um, again, I wanted to mention in order to get those wireframe lines out of the way, check in your viewport render settings and it should say geometry only right at the top. There's a little check bar box there. And then also if that's still rendering out with those lines, go back into your to your project file and just hit N as in naughty and A as an apple. And it should remove that for you. So, uh, Juliana. All right, so I had the issue with the wireframes still showing up like in the render, which the first thing said here, 
uh, quick inside the render settings first to make sure the, the <laughs> you know, geometry. Oh my god, I kept reading that wrong in my head. Geometry only boxes ticks. I couldn't find that box, um, but I did do the next step with the pressing N first and then A, which removed it uh, from the actual scene, which then removed it from the render. For, yeah. Um, but I, I could not find the box to tick on here. Like, Let me go back here. And this is great because we just went over this under filter, right under here. So under the viewport render, you want to make sure you click on this, this one right here, and then click under filter. And then there should be a spot right here that says geometry only, and then you'll just make sure that little box right there is ticked. And and then if not, that that's when you can hit the NA. M most of the time it is. I, it just must be the file. Um, it must just be the file, the template that ha is having an issue or something. I'll just have to remake the template for next semester. And I'm happy to see that you know, I mean, I'm not happy that you guys are coming into this issue, but it's good for me to know that this issue is happening so that I can adjust the file for the next class. And I, I know it sucks for you guys, but um, I'm obviously not going to dock you points for that as long as it's fixed later on down the road. But yeah, if you just hit that NA, because it's rendering your viewport, your the viewport renderer, what we're working in right now, is rendering what you're actually seeing in the viewport. So whatever you're seeing here, once you hit the control R, that's essentially what you're going to see in your render. What if you're rendering under the viewport render engine? So, um, but I'm happy that eventually worked out for you. On here, like, yeah, I know it's, there's a lot of, so that'd be my question is where, would you where is that geometry only? Okay. Good, good, good question though, Juliana, because there's a lot of different, uh, clicking inside of, if you click this, this menu and then it brings up these other paths and you got to click on this one and this one there it goes deep so all right bear hello i um i will fix the title i did see that it was slightly off um i didn't notice it before but it's totally off so i'll send you that um what was i gonna say oh yeah the squash and stretch i i know what you mean when you say that about the pepper too so i'll fix that Cool. The, the team ball. Um, I didn't use um, a um, a image for the for the floor. I actually used a material. Okay. I was wondering, like, should I change it to an image? Because when you were saying to fix the tiles, I was like kind of confused because I'm like, I didn't change the tiles. I changed the um, texture preview size. And that's why I was like, I didn't even use the image. I think I messed up. But um, no, you can if you're using the image. That's okay. So the um, first of all, awesome. I like that you're repeating, like you're going through the feedback that I gave you and and asking questions about that feedback too, because you know that's something I want you guys to do. If you're still confused on the feedback that I give you, I'd rather you guys have me clarify it than just try and figure it out and then be stumped. And so that, um, that is the thing. I, I wish I could bring this up right now because, but my, my max on, I haven't had a second to renew it. Um, but with that being said, so, uh, you can not only in a side of material, you can not only change the resolution settings, but you can also change the tiling of that as well. So it just, cause it's a seamless pattern, right? the the texture the material is and so you're just scaling that pattern down to show more of it and so you can tile it uh the other thing i think we had it was just the lighting with it so i mean it wasn't it wasn't terrible in yours it wasn't like it was so washed out it was an issue you can also try and turn down the intensity of your lights and see if that works let me know bear though if you need more help on that or more explanation It was like kind of a, I, I took it as like a list of things. So I'm like taking a mental note, like this, this, thing, I fix this, I fix this. So um, I'll make sure that's okay. Oh yeah, with the, um, 
the camera, I was wondering, is there an easy way to make the shake? Because um, between the impact of when the ball hit the ground, I moved the camera like left five times and then I key framed it and then I moved it right five times and then I key framed it and then I moved it left five times and then I key framed it and then I moved it right five times and then I key framed it. Yeah, you got that right. The hard way. I was wondering if there was like an easy way to do that because I don't want to do that anymore. But um, and uh, I don't. I think it was in the written instructions. It said something about having the ease on those two frames. I'm not sure exactly where those. Yeah, I'm not sure. But um, let me know specifically what you're talking about, or just take like a screenshot of the section inside of the module, and you can send it to me, Bear, and I'll check and see what that that says specifically and see what it means and um no there's no easy way to do it I love that you added it in there that way um I was trying to figure out if there was like a camera shake effect I thought there there was kind of a camera shake effect inside of After Effects but it didn't work the way I was wanting to and then I was going to try and use a wiggle effect on it but that also wasn't working the way I was thinking it would so the way you would do it right just manually that's what I that's the only logical idea that I thought of doing it is essentially going to the exact frame inside of After Effects you have your your rendered out video, right? And then going to the exact moment when the ball hits the ground and just keyframing the position changes just like you did. Just very slightly um, within a very short frame of time. Because if it were to, if you were to drop something on the ground and it shakes a little bit, it doesn't shake forever, right? The camera won't continue to shake for a really long time. But if you just quickly do that position or, or rotation, not a position keyframes but rotation keyframes and you just kind of wiggle it around left and right back and forth back and forth a little bit then you'll get that same effect and you just won't have to you're not going to have to animate as many keyframes as when you you're animating the camera inside of cinema 4d and then it's going to render out a lot quicker and it'll give the same effect the only thing that you will have to do is you'll have to scale up the video just slightly so let me show you guys let me see if I can, let me just import the video that we have as an example. And I'm going to bring this down into, nope, let's bring it into the main folder. Right here. Ooh, I guess not. <laughs> let me bring it in and drop it. Okay, cool. And then I'm just going to silence all three of them so you don't have to hear it. And you'll... Click on your layer, you'll bring up your rotation property, you're going to keyframe it, and you're going to zoom in on your timeline so we can get to minute keyframes here, or to minute little frames. And then we're going to go and we're going to kind of rotate it just slightly here, like maybe let's do three. That's a, even a little bit too much. I would just do two. There we go. And then we're going to go another two keyframes, and we'll go negative two. And we'll go another two keyframes and we'll go to one. Then another two keyframes, so on and so forth, right? Negative one, back to zero here. Now, one of the things that you guys are noticing right away, probably, is that when it is shaking, these areas up here are showing. Now, how do we get rid of this? We just slightly increase the size of the video. We don't have to keyframe that increase we just hit s for scale and we're just gonna maybe bring this up let's see 103 percent let's go a little bit higher 105 tiny bit more let's scale it into 108 there we go and we know that it's gonna as it's shaking here it um you still see the video it's a little bit more i like to say punched in you're punching in on the scene a little bit more but um, but you get that camera shake and it's a lot quicker, right? I did that in two seconds and then, and then it shakes like that. And, and you can add a little position keyframes in there as well if you wanted to. So you could do both quick, quick tip for you guys. If you want to have multiple parameters in view, 
on a certain layer inside of After Effects. If you hit U, first of all, if you hit U here, it'll show my keyframed, it'll show my keyframes. And then if I hold down Shift and hit another, we'll hit um, the, the P for position, right? It'll bring up that second one there and I can keyframe it and then start making the changes along with it, right? I can, I can bring it down a little bit, make sure that it's not showing any of the, of the other area. I can move it over a little bit and this will just add a, another bit of dimension and then check this out. So, right, we did an up keyframe or we went down or up either way, and then we went over. If I just take these three keyframes, zoom in them real quick, I'm gonna select these three keyframes. I'm gonna hit Control C, Control V to copy them right there. But they they go back to it goes back to zero. You're gonna notice that copied them in the same exact order where it's like zero, and then it moves it up or down or whatever and to the side. And we don't want that, we want it to end on zero. So all you have to do is take those three keyframes that you copied or pasted. You're going to right click and you go to keyframe assistant and down to time reverse keyframes. And what that does is it just takes your, your keyframes right there and it swaps them. It flip flops them. And so as soon as I hit that, check that, make sure you're looking at the value right now here. You can see that um, as soon as I right click keyframe assistant, time reverse them. Oh, did I already do it? I had already done it. <laughs> I'd accidentally hit it while he's doing that, but I'll just show again. So you'll right click on there. Notice that here the, the position property is not centered. It's not at essentially zero because if you were to take 1920 by 1080, and divide each by half, that's gonna give you the center of your composition. And so the values for the position to be in the center of the comp is 960 by 540. If you ever want something centered in the middle of your composition, it's gonna center that anchor point, right? So you're gonna to wanna to make sure the anchor point is centered on your object, and then you can just go into the position, you'll type in, you'll type in, uh, 960 in the X value and then 540 in the Y value and that'll bring you to absolute center of your composition. But with that being said, you can see that it's not at the absolute center yet. So you'll just select those, right click, keyframe assistant, time reverse keyframes, and then it brings that back to its regular position. And then there you go, you have a camera shake. Now to make it more interesting, you can take this these position keyframes and just offset them by one frame. And then it'll give it kind of this nice slowing or just kind of like this sense of it's vibrating slowly out, right? Like that, almost like that pendulum swing that slowly fizzles out. It, it's kind of the same feeling there. So um, I don't know why I saved that, but that is how you do the camera shake um, manually inside of After Effects. And it's so much quicker than having to do it inside of Cinema 4D. But great question, great way to problem solve that. Even though you did it in Cinema 4D, you still thought critically on how to fix the problem. But yeah, so I'll fix those. And I did miss the last um, couple lives. Um, when I rewatched it, you had said um, like the stresses of wanting things to be perfect. You'll have gray hair before you're 30. And I just thought that was funny because. I totally found a gray hair, so I'm like, yeah, you're, you're totally right about that. I mean, also, there's like, I mean, there's uh, genetics that I have to play into that, too, but I'm telling you, Bear, like, you just can't, you can't, I understand. Usually, all of us who are in this field are perfectionists at some point or another, and we feel this immense pressure to be perfect all the time, and it's just not like that. That's a reality of things. That's a reality of how the world works and it just takes a lot of growing and living to to recognize that but I from my experience and telling you guys now so that you guys don't go through that and and just knowing and giving yourself some room to make those errors because if we knew everything why are you taking classes you know if you knew how to do it all right away perfect at the first time you could drop my class right now and I would 
high five you and be like, dude, get a job. <laughs> you don't need me. And so, you know, there's just give yourself, be patient with yourself and give yourself room to fail because we all fail at some point. But from failing, you learn so much and you learn how to approach something the next time. And you apply that. If you take that essentially thought and you apply it to everything in life, you, you know, you're not going to be so stressed about being perfect all the time. But I get it. I know I'm there 90% of the time anyways. And I have to sit there and check myself and be like, it's okay that I didn't do it right the first time. I'll get it right the next time. It becomes a problem when you're consistently making that 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 error or that causing that issue and um you've you've been told already how to fix it. You've been told that, you know, you know, like if if I give you feedback and I have to give you the same feedback three or four times, at that point I'm tired of saying that and I'm going to be like, "All right, you're just not going to get credit." You know, because because obviously I, I've tried and tried and tried and it's just not resonating. But that's just a way to apply it. So just take what you learn. You know, take it with a grain of salt. Just know you're not going to be perfect. It's okay. I'm not expecting you guys to be perfect. I have no expectations with this. I expect some things to be harder than others. Some people to struggle more than other people. And that's just how that's just how class happens, you know. And, and the only way to, to, to get around that is to ask questions. And to make those mistakes and learn from those mistakes. And that's why we teach this way. is because you just learn from those mistakes. And then going through and problem solving the the issues. By you not sh knowing how to do the camera shake but just trying to do it anyways. That's awesome. That shows initiative. And initiative is something that would get you hired for a job. Because they're going to be like, okay, well, they don't know how to do that. That's okay. Not everyone knows how to do everything. But they, they're they showing that they're willing to learn and willing to look it up. Can't You can't teach that lesson. That has to come um, with life experience. So good for you. Way to go. Well, yet we have all these applications that we get to download for, like, different types of animation, like 2D or 3D. But... I am wondering, how will we be using Photoshop for, in like, animation? So, uh, Photoshop yeah. is more or less, uh, hello, okay, Megan, so first of all. I kind of opened your video while I was continuing with what I was saying prior. But, hold on one second. Okay, no. I'm sorry, I just got a, a little distracted over my message, but, um, what you'll use Photoshop for is for creating assets. And by assets, I mean imageries, illustrations for your videos, especially right now while we're going to be doing the Monarch Butterfly. I'm okay if you guys create your asset inside of Photoshop if that's where you feel comfortable. And that's the reason we have those programs on there. We're, we're not going to use Character Animator. I know it said, I believe the thing said to... to to download that in the beginning of the class. Um, that's about the only one that we don't use very often. And then we also don't use animate as much, but you guys, as we go further along in class and you're learning more and you want to apply those to your videos, I'm not gonna say, no, you can't. And so Photoshop, Illustrator, those two are gonna come into play when you're creating your own imagery. Um, so just keep that in mind. And then if you don't like using those specific things to create your images, like if you like to use Procreate because it works better for you, like I said, just make sure that you're working within a canvas size that is the same as what your your composition size is going to be. So 1920 by 1080. And then when you're working digitally, if you're going to create artwork inside of any kind of art program, specifically pixel-based, so Photoshop or Procreate, and you're never going to print it. The DPI stands for dots per inch. Let me, let me write this down for you guys. This is a good one to know. DPI equals dots per inch. It is for printing, right? The higher number is, is going to be for how, how many dots they want you to there's going to be printed within an inch. And so when you're printing, always go for 300 DPI. That's 
a lot of dots per inch, right? But that is what you're going to want to have because you are going to want to have a high resolution print. And if you go any lower than that, it's going to look pixelated when you print it out. If you're doing, if you're never going to take that image and you're never going to put it on an any kind of like physical items or you're never going to print it into a poster or anything like that, then you can work in 72 DPI, which is for digital. If it's going to live in a screen forever, you can always do 72 DPI. Um, and I just suggest doing that because it keeps your file size down smaller. When you're working at 300 DPI and you go to animate that, it is going to take a long time to render out because it's it's just got that much more information into the file versus um, the 72 DPI, which is a much smaller file size, right? So if it's living digital forever, um, go ahead and put it at 72 DPI. If you're not sure if you want to keep it digital or if you want to print it at some point, do the 300 DPI, but just be aware it will it will affect the way your program runs. And, and how quickly it renders. So meaning it's also when you play back the video, when you're trying to play back in real time to see what your animation looks like, it is going to chug. It is going to take a long time to show that animation. So just have those, it's a good thing for you guys to know right now before you start creating those assets. As far as um, vector-based ones, Vector-based assets are based off of mathematics. They're not based off of pixels. So Illustrator, for example, you can take something that's this, you can make it the size of a postcard and blow it up to the size of a billboard. It doesn't matter. It will always be sharp and it will always be clear because it is based off of the images being drawn based off of mathematics. And so it just either minimizes or maximizes those values, whatever, however it does it. And it, it keeps your object clear. And that's why I say working in vector base is a lot easier. But if you're going to work in pixel base, 72 DPI and either do 1920 by 1080 or work in a higher resolution for because you want to work at your screen size because as soon as you make that illustration smaller than what you're going to animate at, it's going to turn out pixelated. It's not going to look good. And then you're going to have to redraw all of that over again. Because once it's once it's made there, and once the file is saved as that small size, you can't just resize it like you can in a vector-based program. So it takes a little bit of planning to go through and do when you're illustrating for animation or for motion design. Things to keep in mind. Good question there because I didn't even, you know, that didn't wash over my mind right away to let you guys know. But that's really important because you, it happens to be at just the right time because we're going to be creating our assets this week. My question for this week is... Um, What's up, Nick? Uh, when we were doing this assignment, the previous assignment, that got moved ahead a week, which would have been due last week, but was due this week instead. Um, that assignment. What? I Principles of Motion Design, the 3D one. That's what I'm assuming you're talking about. I don't really see a reason why we had to add the third scene. I mean, sure, it's old content, but... Are you talking about the bounce? Why do we have to add the third scene? I don't really see it. Or with the weight one. So basically, we did the three scenes were to match the After Effects one. It's to show, it's not only to drill down that, um, the Principles of Motion Design, the with the, the squash and stretch the weight and the impact, right? Showing that you know how to work with velocity and um, and the motion and momentum, right, for impact. Knowing how to, to um, knowing how to, um, how do I want to say, like portray, but no, knowing how to show weight to something by working with keyframes and curves. And then, I don't know why I did that. Sometimes I do things, you guys, and it makes me feel old. And just forgive me, please. But, and then the other one was the squash and stretch, showing that you guys kind of know how to how to create fluid-like objects or how to make something look malleable and like it can be pulled apart. And that's why we did, um, that's why we did the two assignments based off of that. That's the part one, why we did that. And so you can nail down those principles and understand that this is what you need to do to pull those things off. Now, the other reason that we did it in both After Effects and Cinema 4D is to show that you guys can do it 
to to give you guys the skills to be able to do it in both programs and in both versions essentially right that now you know how to do it in 2d and now you know how to do it in 3d and if we were to jump in the 3d one right away you would have um it would have been more confusing because you have three different um orientations in there or three different not orientations but axes as far as your xyz there's different coordinates in there and it's much more complicated versus it's more, it's, more, it's more confusing versus 2D, which is just two different coordinates. And actually today, we're going to be working in a little bit of 3D in After Effects. It's not real 3D. It's technically 2.5D, but I'll get to that Fundam here. Fundamental purpose for adding the third scene. <laughs> yeah, that's my question. I can ask another. Um, why is it that some of the materials in Cinema 4D work, but yet some of the other materials don't. Yeah. That's the backup question, because you didn't like the first one. No, the first one's good. I understand that one. I, I know it feels repetitive, and it's kind of boring, but that's the reason we do that, is to really drill that into your head. Um, as far as, like, why certain materials work inside of these projects versus not, is based on the renderer the render engine that we're using. Like I said before, not everyone has um, not everyone has powerful machines to be able to render something quickly when it's in uh, the the physical based render or when it's in the redshift render. That takes a lot of computing power and and it it takes into account rendering lights differently and rendering out reflections and transparencies differently and bump maps and a lot of different things that you guys just don't understand right now about materials because like I said materials is an entire wormhole that people focus solely on in their careers there are people out there that just work on materials and texturing objects in 3d that's their entire job so I mean it's it's that dense of a subject um, so that's why we have you guys rendering your videos in the viewport renderer. And because we're doing that in the viewport renderer, it's not, some of these materials just don't work well with it because they're complex materials, or there might be something inside of the settings of the material that just doesn't work well with the render and with the render engine that we're using. So that's why I recommend um, let's not jump down that rabbit hole. You'll learn more about those in different classes and to just pick a different material. Or what you can do is start learning how to make your own materials. I can, uh, maybe what I'll do is I'll try and find a video and link it to you guys inside of, um, inside of Slack. There's also, if you guys go to, if you guys go to, I think there's a Maxon. Yeah, I follow them. Maxon training team. These are the guys who make Cinema 4D. This is the, like, you know how there's the Adobe suite that makes After Effects and all that stuff. This is essentially, Maxon is essentially like the big company that does Z, um, ZBrush and also Cinema 4D and Redshift and all that other stuff. This specific channel, they do tons of tutorials on on just how to work inside of Cinema 4D and doing different things. So if you guys really want to deep dive and start working on that and learning how to do it, you can. Uh, with that being said, keep in mind how your computer works with certain things. Don't get frustrated when it doesn't work because of that or where it's not rendering very quickly. But there's, um, I know they do one on materials and just kind of understanding materials. I've seen it in the past. And so I will try and link that one to you guys so you guys can see more about working with materials for you there but good question there overall guys you guys are nailing it on the questions each week you're doing well in the participation grades doing well on the the projects and with that said let's kind of jump right into this um again i'm going to shut my camera off here sarah said in the chat 2.5d is so fun it pleases my eyes when it's done right yeah and there's um you know, recently in the past few years, it's become like a more popular aesthetic amongst motion designers faking 3D inside of After Effects because a lot of 2D artists don't necessarily know how to do 3D work. 
usually you focus in more of one topic than the other topic, but yeah, it is, it is really fun to work with and it's, um, you know, it's tricky, but it's, it's fun. And if it is done right, it looks really cool. So let me shut off my video here. <laughs> yeah, 3D modeling. That's why you see, um, so in the chat, Sarah said off topic, but 3D modeling seems like a nightmare, but I've always wanted to learn it. Uh, and that she has tried Blender once and she almost cried. And that is a lot of people deal with that. Um, it's, it, that's, when it comes to 3D work, there's so many different aspects that come to 3D, right? There's, um, so there's directing, where people work specifically with cameras inside of 3D programs and that's all they do and they pick shots and they do essentially do what a director would do is filming whatever's inside of whatever's being animated or whatever is inside of cinema for or their 3D program, right? There's people who specifically just do modeling because that's what they're great at. There are people who specifically work in just lighting design because lighting is a whole other thing it's because essentially what you're essentially doing is you're recreating the real world or you're bending real world physics and real world scenarios to do something very specific and it takes a lot of work I'm not saying you can't do more than one job inside of there but in general you'll you'll find one specific like subsect of 3d work that you will like to do the most and you'll just focus on that so you know that's why they have people who are really good at rigging characters in 3d there's people who are really good at animating characters in 3d people who are great at um like inside of video games right you have um environment design there's just so many different like subtopics that you can go into with that but um, I, let me bring this back up actually. So to the animation of the three scenes with the butterflies, um, make sure you guys go over the skills that you're going to learn. And here's some shortcuts for illustrator, uh, creating the illustrator assets. You're going to need a butterfly body top view, which is going to be the wing and the body, um, uh, with the side view. You're going to have mountains in the clouds. If you don't want to specifically do mountains, I'll allow you to do like a forest scene. Um, but something that is applicable to like a nature scene that you would see monarch butterflies. I mean, think of what we're talking about, the pattern of their their flight pattern. Think of anything that looks like that throughout um, basically North American. You can illustrate it, right? Uh, but you're most likely not going to see is a tropical scene. So that is one thing I do not want to see. No tropical, but you guys can do like forest or you can do mountain scene, some other nature scene that you, that is more likely where you'd see a monarch binder, butterfly. Uh, there's techniques for these, how to draw this inside of, um, illustrator right here. And then if you want to use a different drawing program, feel free to do so making sure to export as a PNG with an alpha channel. That's a big thing. Make sure it has an alpha channel, right? And make sure each asset is a thousand pixels by a thousand pixels. Um, that's okay. Or you can work in the 1920 by 1080 aspect ratio and it will automatically match your, your composition size. So there's some more videos on here that go into a lot more detail of putting the entire scene together. If you guys want to watch these in, in very detailed videos, if you need to do that, I suggest learning what you're going to learn right now and um, trying to apply it on your own at first. And then if you need help going to these, and then if there is specific things I don't get to right away in this class, then um, I'll, I'll direct you to where to go to watch those specific what do I say? Like topics or specific techniques on here. Uh, we probably won't get to the animated grass one, so you can watch this. Um, there is also other ways to create animated grass, and I'll see if I can find a video that will show that if we don't get to it. 
And then I highlighted your deliverables right here on what I want to see when you guys, whoop, that's wrong. This one, let's try this. Oh, that's wrong. Huh, I don't know what I'm doing. One second here, you guys. I think there's someone at my door, like at my house. Just one second. All right, sorry about that, you guys. I just, I'm home alone right now, and that was a weird sound I heard, so I needed to quickly investigate it. Um, and then Sarah asked in the chat if it would be allowed to use Clip Studio Paint, um, and that's fine. You can use any kind of um, illustrating program that you guys are most comfortable and quickest in. I'm not gonna dock you for that. Just make sure that you're exporting things out as a PNG, right? Especially if it's not a vector-based program. Anyways, back to the deliverables. Um, one MP4 is what we need, and it has to contain the following. I need to see three butter animated butterfly scenes, specifically the icon scene with the circle around it, and then the butterflies moving over the map of North America with animated paths. That's the biggest, you know, part of the biggest part of that scene is that you show that you can animate paths. Also, the kaleidoscope of butterflies flying past a nature scene. And then I want you to make sure that the paths of the butterflies are offset and they range in scale. And um, you guys will see what I'm talking about there. But it's going to end with one last scene of uh, the credits, but it's going to have your name in it. And I want to hear music and a voiceover. And I would like to hear them appropriately, um, their levels appropriate, right? Now I'm going to minimize this and let's get into this After Effects or the Illustrator file. So this is what you're going to get if you download the Illustrator file that I had uploaded inside of the module. It's not the PNG, it's the .ai file. And I uploaded this one so that you guys could have a little bit more freedom with uh, customization of it, right? Uh, but when you open it, it's going to... Be, it's going to have this weird like title here, and that's just because it's a, an asset that I downloaded off a stock site. What you're going to want to do is you're just, if this isn't separate from it, this is the background, you're going to want to delete that because if you don't delete it, it's going to have a background inside of your, inside of your um, After Effects file, right? So if I, if I do this and then go into After Effects and go into the North American map scene, you can see it has a background, but then because I have specifically, I'm working with the after or the Illustrator file. And so that's the reason that that's the reason that um, you see that background. But remember what I said when you're working within Adobe products and you're bringing them into each other, whatever you change in the other program will automatically change over there. So as soon as I delete that background, which I just did, um, and I save this, um, it's gonna ask it. It's gonna ask you if you want. You're gonna have to save it again, and you can just save it as the converted file, or you can just do this, delete that, and save it as is. And it'll ask you, say it already exists. Do you want to replace it? Just hit yes, and then it just essentially overwrites the one that you had saved prior. But as soon as I did that, it disappears from there. So. You can make changes to the colors of this if you want to. You can add a uh, different background. I would suggest adding the background inside of After Effects, but if for some reason you want to add like a water background or something like that, like as far as just a blue background, you can do that in here too. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna shake you guys for that. Just like I said, keep in mind your design 
design choices. So I'm going to close out Illustrator, give you guys a little tip on that. And inside of, inside of After Effects here, last class I had imported the Illustrator files and then created essentially a comp the main composition here. And I brought in the the audio and we talked a little bit about the audio and making sure that things are the levels we spoke about levels and waveforms and whatnot so let's get into the animation section of this so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to view my timeline all the way at the like I want to see the entire timeline I'm going to take my playhead and move it to the beginning and um, we're going to draw, we're going to do an example of path animation. That's the biggest part. That's one of the biggest parts of this project is, is knowing what a path animation is. So I am just going to add a quick background into here. I'm just going to do a black solid there. Pops off screen. Bring it over here. Change my color to black. This way you guys can see everything that I'm going to do. And I'm going to take that solid and just kind of drag it down here. And I am going to quiet these, these two audio files because I don't want... Ah, I'm in there while I'm playing. Also, I'm sorry, I let, uh, I let a little monster into my room, so he might just mess with things in the background. So if you hear a lot of things falling down... There is no earthquake. It's just a cat. And yes, I am a crazy cat leader and I'll own it. <laughs> so now we're going to, the first thing we want to do is make a shape here. So I'm going to grab the pen tool up at the top and I'm going to pick a different color here. We'll pick a color that will represent that monarch, great, and orange. I'm going to draw, just click here, click here, click here, in here, and draw a triangle. And let's increase the stroke for whatever. Just increase it to there. And this is an example. So you're going to take this example and you're going to apply it to your monarch butterfly. And we are going to, we want this to move along a path. And, and, and previously you learned to animate something moving across screen. You learned to animate it with the position properties. And we're not going to do that here because we want this thing to move along a path. Let's see exactly what I'm mentioning. We want this to move along a path that is more complex than what we could do with position keyframes. And if we did do it with position keyframes, it would take a lot of work. And so you're going to click off of the shape layer because you don't want to draw. You don't want to draw on that layer again. In fact, let me rename the layer, which is best practices. We'll call this like paper plane that's what it looks like to me and we're going to click off of that and then we're going to proceed to draw a path that we want this paper plane to kind of go around so let's draw this like this remember if you click and hold and drag you'll get curves and then i'm going to go like this go back on there it's kind of and we're going to go all the way off screen here and then Specifically for this one, let's well let's rename the layer. So let's flight path. Right here. And we want to remove the fill on this. So there's two ways to do that. You can either go up to the fill and you can hit hold down alt and you can click repeatedly to cycle through until there's like a red slash here showing that there's no fill. So I'll show you, you guys how to do that now holding down alt I'm clicking through then it removes the fill right or you can go through here let's go back a couple times like we had it before and you're gonna you would unfurl your your layer and then you're gonna unfurl the contents tab right here and then you see it says the path here and then it says stroke and fill we're going to just delete that fill right off of the layer, and it's gone. If for some reason you do that and you need to add it back, you just select this little button right there that's next to the add, and you just click fill, and you'll be able to add a fill or stroke or whatever back to it. 
You can also, I think, just add the fill up here like normal and it will also add it in. Um, so we've got our flight path here and we want this, we want this plane, the paper plane, to move along that flight path. Let me change my layers so that my paper plane is on top. I'm going to change the color here. Something a little easier to see. Oh, this will be good green. I'm going to save that. And now, what's nice is in After Effects, you can copy from a path and paste to a position. Um, that sounds like a lot of words. <laughs> what am I talking about? So the path that we created went, that we want this, this to fly around or to go on, to move on, you're going to select that path layer and you can either unfurl this and get back down to the path or if you go into your search bar here and you just type path, it should pull that up for you. Right here, perfect. Now, if you have more than one shape with inside of a layer, it will pull up all of those paths if you do the search option. So just keep that in mind. Uh, I want to redo that. Type in path. I'm going to select that path right here. Now, make sure that you're selecting this one and not this one because this is going to select the actual entire path and this one just selects the folder that the path is in. So you want to click on that and you're going to hit control C to copy and then we're going to go to the paper plane position and we're going to hit P because we've memorized that path of the flight path. We're going to click directly on directly on this position property. Don't click on here. Don't click on the stopwatch. Not that. You click directly on this the word position and you're just going to hit control V to paste it. Now all of a sudden you see a couple things happen, right? The, the paper plane disappears and all of a sudden you get this set of keyframes here out of nowhere, right? What this is, is these keyframes are points along that path that After Effects makes up that allows that object to move along that path and it automatically animates it for you. Now, if I hit play and play this back, the object moves around the, along the path, but um, it's a little fast and also it's not in the right direction, which we'll address here in a second. Uh, and there's, it doesn't really, as it moves along the path, right, it's not changing its orientation. Normally right here you would think it would turn and face that way, uh, but it doesn't. Now, why is the object moving from left to right and not right to left? That is a matter of the direction that you draw your path in the first place. If I were to have started over on the right hand side and drawn my path this way to end on the left hand side, it would animate in the opposite way. Now if you accidentally make your path and you do this and you realize, oh no, it's going the wrong way, that's okay. Like we learned earlier, you're gonna just select all those keyframes, you're gonna right click on them, go to keyframe assistant and time reverse those keyframes. And then all of a sudden, it goes from right to left. So that's a nice little trick to learn there. Another thing, the timing, right? Let's say it's taking, it's going too fast. It's two seconds. I mean, that's kind of appropriate, but just for example's sake, let's say it's moving too quickly. You're going to select on that last keyframe, making sure all of your keyframes are, are highlighted, and you're going to hold down Alt, and then you're going to click and drag. And remember what that does is it extends, or it can shorten, holding down Alt and moving, extending or shortening, short, yeah, is that a word? Shortening? Yes, short, shortening. For some reason it sounded weird. But you're you're just changing the timing of your animation and the, you know the longer you want the further apart they're going to be oops didn't register me holding down the alt you longer you want it the further apart the keyframes are the faster you want it the tighter the keyframe spacing is hmm now
let's change. First of all, I don't like that timing. We'll keep it at the two seconds. Let's go back to here. Undo that, holding down Alt. Let's move it this way. And let me point this out here. How does this, how does it know where to place the object on the path? The, what is animating along the path is not the actual object, but the anchor point. So it is mapping that path to the position of your anchor point. So if you don't place your anchor point in the correct space of your object in the first place, it will not lead the animation in the correct way. For instance, if I wanted it for some reason to be led by the front of the triangle or the tip of the triangle, I would have wanted to move my anchor point to this section right there. And that way when I was to, if I were to copy and paste the path information to the position of the the object it would be wherever that anchor point is and it would move it along from the front of the in this example it would move it all from the front of the triangle so but you know that's a little bit of information to you guys on how or where it is it is linking these two things together so if you didn't want the if you don't want the line there, right, you can always go into here because essentially the only thing we needed this specific layer for was to copy the path at this moment, right? If you didn't want that for some reason, you would hide that path. And that way, when you click off, you notice that the object is still animating along the path because now the path information is in the position parameter of the object itself. But we're going to keep this on. You could also uh, delete this layer if you didn't want it, but I suggest working in a non-destructive workflow, which means don't delete things, just hide them. Leave them in there. Only delete once everything's finalized and you can clear out your, your your project file but in the meantime leave it there because you never know if you're going to need it and so working non-destructively I will just hide that flight path um, actually I want to turn it on because I want to show you guys I changed my mind very quickly I want to show you guys about the orienting along a path we want this to turn in the same direction as the path goes and so we're going to select the object and there's a couple different ways that you can do this you can um, hit a keyboard shortcut or you can you can manually find it. So the way to manually find it is you select your layer and you can right click on that layer and inside of, I believe it is transform, it should say, yep, auto orient right there. Now notice there is also a shortcut right here that you can use. These, all of this information right here are shortcuts, keyboard shortcuts that you can press simultaneously that will, that will, you know, do whatever specific thing that it says there. And so I wanted to auto orient along that path. I'm going to hit control alt plus zero. So, which it automatically did because I clicked on it. Um, and then when it brings this up, you want to make sure you click orient along path. And then you're going to hit OK. And then all of a sudden, it is orienting, it is facing the path, and then it's moving along that path in the correct direction, right? It, it's, it's, it's twisting around the path and following it more precisely. Now, the only thing that's wrong here is it's moving from right to left, like I had changed it. And that's how I want it to move. But the object is now turned around. That, the only thing that you have to do here is you have to bring up your rotation value. There's no keyframing. You're just going to rotate that so that it is oriented and rotated in the correct direction. The orientation is to follow the shape of the path more precisely and to kind of automatically rotate the object and, and to adjust the object to fluidly move along the path. The rotation is just to turn it in the correct direction.
if it happens. Sometimes it works perfectly and sometimes it doesn't. But then all of a sudden, it's more precise on the way I want it to face. It's more precise on um, following along that path specifically. And it looks much better. And then, uh, you know, always remember to ease your keyframes. So I can go ahead and whoop, wrong, can select these. And I can go into the graph editor. Another thing I'm thinking about right now that just came up to my mind when I looked at the, the graph editor and the curves. If your dimensions are separated, I've been telling you this entire time to separate your dimensions. You cannot do that when it comes to path and like copying a path to a position. You have got to have them together. If you separate the dimensions, it just will not work at all. And so just make sure that you don't have them separated or if they are automatically separated that you join them together, right? Um, most of the time, if you're just animating, a lot, if you're, the key rule here at this point you guys can understand is that if you are only an, animating in one specific orientation, it's best to work with your dimensions separated. But if you're planning on moving it in multiple position changes on both the X and Y value, then keep them together. It's just going to work out better for you in the long run. And so I'm just going to select this and we're going to select these keyframes. All the, in fact, let me just go to the dope sheet view again. We're just going to select these keyframes and I am just going to go in here and ease them or not. So I am going to hit select this one and select this first and last one. If you notice these ones in between are shaped differently, all of a sudden we went from diamonds to circles and that is because these are in between frames that it is, it's in between keyframes that it's creating. So I'm just gonna select the first one and the last one and I am going to go into here and then ease those. And then you can go in here and ease the values as needed to create a motion that looks smooth. Let me see, just hitting that automatically makes it look smoother. Notice that it starts off kind of slow, speeds up, and then slows back down into position. Ready? Watch. Speeding up, slowing down. You don't see its full stop because it happens, you don't see the full start or stop because they both happen off screen. But um, you guys should know enough about easing keyframes at this point that, that you know, you should understand. How it works now let me see this technique is the technique that you are going to use let me show you guys exactly where this technique is going to be used in your video so it is going to be used here notice that these are kind of being drawn on a path I'm going to show you guys how to create this section right here that it's drawing on at the same time. This is called trim paths. We're going to get to that next. But this is just to show you guys where you're going to use this technique in your animation. Right here is where you're going to use it. You're going to draw the shape of a path and you're going to animate these this icon along that path. And also, it's going to happen right here. Notice that these butterflies, if you were to look at this first one right here, notice how it moves along kind of a wiggly path. But then if you notice the rest of them, they all move along the same path. They're all moving and moving and moving along. That is the same exact technique that we were using here, except to make the kaleidoscope effect, you're gonna multiply it, you're gonna duplicate this layer multiple times and you're going to offset them. And you're gonna change the scale on them so that it shows a variety. We should get to that here in a second, or in a little bit. So. How do we make that in that second scene where it's drawing over North America? How do we make that line kind of grow after after the object that we're putting on? In this case, the paper plane, right? So whenever you draw a path inside of After Effects, when you're when you're drawing on a path, when you're animating on a path, let me say it that way, because when you're drawing on a path, you're just drawing in the path. But when you want to animate a path on screen, it is called trim paths. It's a super popular technique. 
animators and motion designers and even editors use this all the time. You see it all the time and all over the place. It's something that you'll definitely want in your tool bag because this is going to be something that you're probably going to be asked to do uh, and know and understand how to do. So in order to add that trim paths onto here, you're going to click on the layer of your path specifically. And you are going to drop the menu down. Let me furl that back up. And you don't have to go inside of contents or anything. What you're going to do is you're going to click this little button here, the little tiny triangle next to the add, and you're going to select trim paths right there. And so once you do it, you notice that the trim paths adds onto the actual to the actual um, to the layer inside of the contents. Real quick, let me see if I want to do this differently. Got that there. It's just the shape. Here is the. Yeah, we're gonna do it. We're gonna do it separately on the flight path. So make sure that you add it to your flight path layer and not to your monarch butterfly layer. So once we add that trim paths, it adds it into the contents here. And when I unfurl this, you're going to see there's a start value, start value, an end value, and an offset value. So what do those mean? Um, this is essentially the percentage of the line that you want to see. Well, we'll get to that part in a second. These all, first you notice these are all keyframable parameters of the trim paths. So you can click on this and keyframe and then move and change it. The other thing that happens is, let me undo that. Let's change this value. So all of a sudden you see this layer, if you're looking up here in the object or on the path, you're noticing that it's it's moving where the start happens. So the beginning of my path happens, or the beginning of the path happens over here, and the end of the path happens here because that's how I drew it initially, right? If you would have drawn it the other way, it would start at different sections. Now, as if I were to move this end path back, notice that it um, it moves opposite, it, you know, the opposite end, the the opposite moves. So where the end section of the path is it decreases in size. What is the offset? Let's say that I wanted only 30% of this entire line showing. What I would do is I would bring the start value or the end value, doesn't matter, to let's say 40. And then what's 30% more than 40? It is 70. So I would change this end value to 70. The difference between these two is how much of that specific path is showing. That's why I specifically changed this value to 40 and this to 70 because it is exactly 30%. So that means exactly 30% of this is showing. Now if I change the offset, notice it moves that 30% along that path. So it's a great way to show like if you wanted lines section and chain, like if you only wanted little lines showing and animating across, you can do that. If I go over, if I crank this up over and over and continue moving, it it will continue to offset it and just go back and forth and back and forth. Notice when I do that, the value here all of a sudden changes to one. When you're working in like a rotation or an offset value like this, once you go from zero to like 360 as far as a rotation goes, that's an, one entire rotation around a circle. It, instead of showing 360 here, it just automatically adds a one. So if I wanted this line, let's say, to move through the path like three times, I would start at zero and zero. Oop. So at a perfectly like zeroed out position and I would move it however many frames and I would type in, let's say I wanted it to move through here twice, two. And then I'm gonna play. Notice it went through, it went through or over the path twice. So that's kind of what this little number means there. But that is basically 
how you use these values inside of the trim paths. Now, um, this, for instance, since I zeroed out the start, 70% of this line is actually showing. And so only 70%, um, like if you change the offset of that, it's just going to move that around as well. So there's different ways to animate these. Some people will just animate the start and the end point. I think that's a little more difficult than getting your percentage right the first time and then animating the offset because at that point you only have one parameter that you're animating instead of two and making changes at that point is a little bit easier. So I suggest that workflow. It's a little less confusing once you get the hang of it. So let's have this, let's have the paper plane or the triangle essentially draw this path on, right? And so do we want to start the end, do we want to animate the end value of this one? or the start value. Um, well, obviously I just said to do neither, but <laughs> let me show you an example of animating this on. We're gonna crank the start value all the way up to 100 because we want this triangle to draw the entire path on first, and then we'll just do a section of the path. And that's why I'm gonna show you this way the first time. So my playhead's at the beginning, I cranked up that start value so that it technically is right here waiting to move. I'm going to keyframe that start value and then I'm going to move forward a little bit until it's about there. And then I'm going to keyframe that start value down. And let's just say you're, I'm going to increase the size of this stroke as well so you guys can see it a little bit better. Let's increase it. To, that'll be good. 18 works. Um, if your animation is going the opposite way for whatever reason and you have to animate your endpoint, animate the endpoint, right? This is just the way mine is moving. So I move it to there and I keyframe the position of the start value to just meet up with the actual object. I'm going to move it a little bit further and then I'm going to keyframe this a little bit further. I'm going to decrease the value until it is hidden by there. And remember, oh, notice that the value of my start is a little too high because it's showing there. So I'm going to increase it slightly, probably like 42 should work. Then I'm going to move it again. And I'm going to decrease that again, right to there. And then I'm going to move it again and bring it the value all the way down to zero. And if I play this back, the line is drawn on, which is awesome. Sometimes you'll need to add an extra keyframe. Sometimes the, um, your, let's say if I take these and shorten it, right? Sometimes you'll be at the point where you're, let's lengthen it actually, where the line is lagging behind here. Um, and you'll just have to adjust your keyframes until it fits all the way, or you might have to add an extra keyframe. Let me go back twice, three times. Or sometimes you'll have to wait to do any easing on both the flight path, the trim path, and the paper plane, or your, in, in this case, your monarch butterfly, right? And the reason I say to hold off on that is so that you can match up the easing to both of them. Mine happens to match up really well. If you do it right the first time like that, it'll it'll look just fine and it'll sell it. Now, the, the powerful thing about this, right, is um, not notice how I was able to adjust that stroke size right away. There was nothing, there was, if I click back on that layer, I can increase and decrease the stroke size. It's not going to matter. I can, um, if you go into the actual shape of your path, right, right here, and you drop that little menu down. You can update things on the stroke, like you can change, you can add dashes to the stroke right down here. It says dashes. If I click that, I can make this a dotted, a dashed line essentially, right? If I, oop, let me take that second and third one off there, but as, as I increase this, right, it changes the spacing in between those dashes. So let's say I wanted a dashed line. 
Um, I don't want these to be butt caps right there. I change it to a round cap. And so you can see that this actually animating it like this is really powerful using the stroke. Now they recently um, added a taper and a wave option to your stroke. So let's say that I didn't want the dash. I'll remove that. Let's say I was like, oh, no, I didn't want that. But I wanted my line to taper. In fact, here, let me show you by animating the offset and the taper. And you will see ex it'll show up exactly like you'll need right here. Because if you look here, notice that the line... Um, it grows on, right? The path the path follows along with the actual monarch icon, but it's tapered here at the end. And so let's let's do that. Um, I am going to hit you on this this pattern. I'm gonna unanimate those. And I am going to open that up. And I only want 30% of that line showing again. So I'm gonna change this to 40. And I'm going to change this to 70. And then I'm going to change the offset so it's back back here. Out of view, right? Oof. If this happens, if this issue happens where it keeps, notice it keeps popping up here, and then once I move it, it pops up here. Um, you can. Ooh, wait. You don't want to do that. Let's shorten this line at that point. You don't want to change the shape of the path just quite yet. We'll talk about that. You want to, if you need to adjust the shape of your path, you need to do that before you, you copy that path to the property of what a, your butterfly, right? You want to make sure that path is right the first time because once you start changing that, if there's another path associated with it, you have to adjust both paths to match because right now they're on two different layers. So if I change the path, the flight path, the it wouldn't change the the path of the paper plane, the path that the plane is following, right? Um, so so a quick way to do that is let's just change the let's make this only twenty percent there, sixty, and then I'm gonna move that slightly off again so you can't see. There we go, and I am going to even though it has a value here, that's okay. It's off screen. I'm just gonna keyframe that value. And then I'm going to move ahead, do the same exact thing I did prior, and I'm going to other way. Click there and keyframe it there. I'm going to move there, and I'm going to move my offset value to there. I'm going to move ahead here. I'm also going to move that offset value. Move here. Keyframe it. And then finally move off screen right to there or over to here. And then I'm going to keyframe this all the way off screen. And we're going to play back and see how well it looks. All right. So in the beginning, this is too slow. Let me do this. So this is going to be a good way that you have to, now it changes the timing. Oh no, see, I just accidentally cut those off. Let me go back here and I'm going to add another keyframe. Or what you can do is you can delay the start of it, right? So I'm going to bring that up here. Let's see if that works. Bring it up a little bit further. Shorten the timing of when the actual line starts drawn. There we go. That worked. And so if I play it again, we've got it moving around like there. And our plane has a tail. Sweet. You can add multiple flight paths on here to make it look like there's multiple little lines going. Um, in your For this one, just do the single one. But um, unless you can make it look really cool, uh, you know, I'd be okay with that if you added a couple of them. But just remember, it's just more animation for you to do. So let's make it, let's taper that end of that stroke. Let's move this so that we can see the entire stroke. And we're going to drop this menu down here. And under the taper, we're going to bring that down. And remember, this is the start and this is the end. So we want to taper the end 
value. So I'm just going to bring that value up. And this right here is the length of your taper. So from here to here, right? Or um, from the entire length of this section, it's only showing 36% or only 36% of it is being tapered. Let's just change that to 30. And then the width, let's see what that does specifically. I'm gonna zoom in here so you guys can see it a little bit better. And I'm gonna change the actual color of the layer because it's very close to that cream. I'm gonna change it to like a blue. There we go, so that's not that bad. In fact, I'm gonna change it to like a dark blue. There we go, a little bit easier to see. Sorry if that was hurting your eyes. I'll keep that in mind next time. So um, here's the taper that happens. And then if you change the width of that taper, it's changing how, how thick that taper is to the end, right? So let's just put it at, we'll put it at 25 because I like even values. And then the easing is where, if you notice kind of right here is where it goes back into its normal width. That easing is either going to bring that up or back. So I'm going to go to the end easing and I'm going to, it's, um, it's, it's changing the width of that specifically where it kind of starts to go back to its normal, normal width specifically of the stroke. And so I'm going to put that at, let's turn that down to 15 and that, you know, then all of a sudden we have a fully tapered stroke and it looks like a little tail, right? A great way to add a tail onto things or to animate right right if you're abstractly animating wind you could do it that way right we're blowing across the screen you can just do the lines like that you can taper both ends of the line using both the start and stop and there's a lot of power within working in this specific manner so Let's explore, because we're already at 8 o'clock, let's explore, well, first of all, this is how you are going to, again, animate this scene right here. Notice that there is um, a drop shadow under this. You add a drop shadow just in your effects. You'll just go to your effects and presets panel over here, and you're just going to type in drop shadow, and you'll drag and drop that to your flight path layer. And then um, it's also going to be the way that you animate. Let me see here. Wrong. The way you animate this scene as well. But notice that you don't see the path, right? So at that point, you would just hide that path layer. And then all of a sudden, you have the butterfly going across screen. Let's say that you wanted multiple butterflies. Well, you're going to take that and um, don't... You're going to copy, first of all, let's duplicate it. Select this layer and you're going to hit Control D and it'll automatically duplicate that. Now let's say, okay, well obviously I don't want them on top of each other because then you can't see. I want to change the positioning of this entire layer and then I also want to change like how big it is. So if I click this and then start, if I just click the layer and start to move it, notice that it starts to actually move the path of my object. Uh, you don't want that. What you want to happen, well, you can do that. You can update the path of your object unless you have, like, the tail following behind it or the path animating on. Because remember, like I said a second ago, if you have the path animating on, you have to change the path to match the, the flight path of the actual object, which would be your monarch butterfly. You're going to go in here, and I think you're going to just select all of the context, the shape. No, you're going to select, is it the hand tool? Where is it? You might have to pre-comp it. Let me see real quick. Uh, this one's going to take, I think this is going to take two classes, to be honest. Possibly. If it takes two classes, I'll add you guys an extra day in here. It has to be pre-composed. 
That's where I had my notes. I was like, how did I do that? Um, remember, the <laughs> answer is usually let's pre-compose. So I'm going to shift control C, and that's going to create paper plane to comp. So let's say paper plane. Well, here, let's do this first. Let's delete this duplication, this duplicate. And we are going to take the first one, and we're going to pre-comp that. Paper plane pre-comp. So what I'm going to name it, and then I'm going to hit OK. And then once that is in a pre-composition, right, I can select this, Control D to duplicate it, and then if I select the the composition entire by itself, and I hit V to grab my selection tool, I can just move this. Oh wait, it cuts off that way. That is not how we did it. Let me. Ah. Uh, Let's duplicate it again. Let's work through this together. And I'm going to change the color of this line so we can see it a little bit more. Let's change it to purple, right? And I am going to drag. Oh, that doesn't work. Let me see here. Double clicking. I swear I had it pre comped. Hmm. Shape. You don't grab the shape. Grab the entire path. No. Duh. I was like, what am I doing here? Go to the position. You grab the entire position of all the keyframes and you make sure they're all selected. I was like, I can't figure out why. And that's because I wasn't, um, I was focusing on the path, but that's not what is technically, where is the path in this layer? It's on the position. And that's how I figured that out. So you select the position right there. And then you're going to select directly onto a keyframe and you're going to move it like this, right? And then um, let's say I want the variation. I want to scale this down so it looks like it's further back. So I'll change this to like 90, 80. Let's go to 80 so it's quite a bit smaller. You guys can see. And then as it moves on, oh, let me turn this layer back on because it was off as far as view. You can see that they move in the same direct way. Um, and one is smaller than the other, and they're in different locations. Uh, but let's, you don't want them all to be moving across the screen at the same time. Notice how in this one, they're all different times. There's a ton of them coming on um, over a period of uh, like a couple seconds, right? And so you're going to want to go back in here, and you're going to want to select this layer, and then you're just going to drag it, right? And then you play it like this, and you'll see this big one starts first, and then this other one comes after, and they look like they're totally different animations, and they are not. And at this point, let's say I wanted to move this up, or take this and move this further down, um, and maybe take this one. Well, first of all, yes, okay, that's correct. Just make sure you're not adding keyframes, right? So you want to make sure you're selecting that specific keyframe, didn't want to do that. Let's lock that layer. You want to make sure you're selecting that specific keyframe. I guess you can't drag and select there. The other thing you can do is if you're trying to select a keyframe on here is you can, like you're trying to select it up here, it's not working. You can directly select the keyframe at the bottom. And then all of a sudden, let me see, I think it should work. Yeah, it's got this one selected here because this is my end one. So I can if you do that, make sure your playhead is on the actual keyframe because as soon as the playhead's off the keyframe and you start moving this, it's going to add an additional keyframe there and you don't want that. So you make sure you're hovering over the keyframe. You're going to click and you can drag. Um, and then for this one, I'll just click this one and I will drag it down further. And then my path is a little bit different than the other one. So that is how you create it's a, the kaleidoscope effect. Let me close this down. The kaleidoscope effect of the third scene. So, nice and quick there. Now let's get the, uh, let's explore the 2.5D in After Effects. So, for this one, for the sake of time, I have the butterfly drawn from the top down view. But right now, let's animate this from 
the side view because that one's a little bit more complex. So I'm going to uh, hide these. The first thing I want to do here is, and get you guys used to doing this as well, when you bring in after or Illustrator files or any vector file, make sure that you select all of these, this little area right here where it looks like the star. You want to turn that little toggle on to all these layers. And that just means that it will, it will, this looks at it as a vector file. It actually looks at it as vector. If those aren't turned on, it will sometimes turn out fuzzy and that's not how a vector file should look. Uh, just a little side note there. So let's grab, let's get rid of, let's hide one wing and let's hide one of the antennas. Let's do the other wing because I'm going the other way. Let's hide this first wing. We're going to hide the first antenna and then we're going to take this body and we're going to hit R and we're going to rotate this sucker into place. Let's move it like this, right? because that's about the angle they, they're at. Grab this antenna here. Let's move this, uh, let's move this anchor point down to the bottom there. So I'm gonna hit the Y button shortcut there. I'm gonna just click and drag down to the bottom of the antenna. And then I'm gonna move that antenna into place. So I'm gonna select the layer and hit P. Let's just make sure you hit V to go back to your selection tool. And then I'm gonna drag and move that. Now notice that the antenna is facing the wrong way. If I go and hit R on the antenna layer and I just type in 180, it should wrong way. It flipped it the wrong way. Let me see here. Let's flip it to, we need to do opposite. So just hit negative zero. Is that gonna work? We need to reflect it here. Short way of doing that. Usually, if you reflect something that's in here, you would type in the negative version of that number or that value, but it's not working there. So, I'm just going to select this antenna because it's facing the right way. And I'm going to hit Y and I'm going to move this down here. I'm just going to move this one. So, select V, my selection tool, move that back down. And then I'm going to take the wing and you have to think about where the wing is going to flap on the actual wing object, right? It's not going to start flapping from the center where this anchor point is. From what we know about anchor points, everything revolves around that, that specific point. So I'm going to move that anchor point right here because that's where I want the wing flaps to happen. And then I'm going to select my selection tool, V, as in Victor, for the selection tool. I'm going to hit R on that layer to rotate it and I'm going to rotate that wing so it's in position. And then I'm going to bring that right here and I'm going to move that over the body because I want it to be appropriately placed. I'm going to bring that up a little bit more and then I'm actually going to move the anchor point back slightly right to there. Okay, so we have our butterfly in position. Notice that if you draw the butterfly from the top-down view, all you have to do is rearrange it to get it to the side view. Um, and we want this wing to flap right. But right now with this rotation, the value that it is, it's only rotating like this. And that is not how a wing flaps. And so we have to turn this layer into a 3D layer. And we do that by making sure we toggle on that little button on the layer that we want to be 3D, which would be right here. And so we're gonna select that. And we also need to make sure that the, anything that is associated with it, right, is going to be made a 3D object as well. And so the antenna that we're using, which is this antenna right here, I'm gonna change all the all of the layers that I'm using, I'm going to turn a different color. We'll turn these to blue, the dark blue, right there. And so the body, we want to make a 3D layer, as well as the antenna here. And now, if I go to hit R, you notice that all of a sudden, there's an additional 
orientation value, and then or there's additional rotation parameter. Then there's this whole orientation right here. In fact, uh, let me let me explain the difference a little bit about what a rotation is versus the orientation. Um, Yes, yes, correct, Bear. We are constructing our own monarch butterflies for this. So that's why you're, you're going to illustrate them inside of Illustrator or whatever your preferred illustration program is. And so I'm going to actually zero out this value here. We want to start at zero. The first thing I'm going to show you is that the anchor point um, is right here. And notice how this looks semi-familiar, right? You you see this inside of Cinema 4D, and when you change when you're changing from scale to oh, let's see, scale, nope, rotation, scale will have three. Now everything has an extra parameter because now we're all of a sudden working in Z space. And um, as you change these, right, the parameters of where that is changing will will also be the same. Let me show you, it's better in the position. You'll see what I mean in the position. Or I'm sorry, in the rotation value. Um, the orientation, you don't want to animate this ever. The orientation is essentially there to place it in the direction that you want it to be initially. The rotation is the value or parameter of that specific layer that you want to animate, especially when you're working in 3D. Orientation is not there when you are on a 2D layer. And so I am going to change the orientation specifically of this butterfly wing to line it back up to where I had it previously because I don't want that rotation value of the Z to be at whatever it was when I had rotated it the first time. And so what you're going to want to rotate is the actual orientation. Whoops. I'm going to type in 300 here so it's a specific value. And then when I go to animate the, I believe it's the Y. Yes, see, there we go. We have it, we have a wing flap because it's rotating in the Y position. Think of it like this. It is rotating around this axis, whatever axis you have it. So if I wanted it to rotate around the z-axis, I would move it like this. And then it's going to rotate around that. Think of it like a post that the axis is sitting on. I'm going to go back here. And I am going to start animating that, right? Let's animate a wing flex. So we're going to start at 0. And we're going to keyframe that y. We're going to move to, let's move, a uh, wing flap kind of happens quickly, right? So we're going to move to, let's do a second. We'll adjust it later. And then we're going to create that flap. Put 70. I'll type the value in directly. Then I'm going to move ahead another second. And then I'm going to copy and paste this zero keyframe so that it goes back all the way up. And then I want to have... I don't want the flaps to look completely even every time because we're going to make a loop and then we're going to just loop this animation. The What I want to do is I want the second wing flap to be a little bit shorter. So it gives a little variety, right? So the first one we did here was 70. Um, I'm going to bring that down to 35. So it's a lot shorter. Actually, let's do 45. And I'm just going to increase that value, 55, until I like the way it looks. There we go. And then I'm going to move my playhead and I'm going to copy and paste that zero value again. Remember, when it comes to looping, if the, if the first and the last keyframe do not match, it will not be an even loop or it will not be a seamless loop, right? If I hit N here to play this composition back and forth, notice that it is flapping back and forth here but I think that I have to move this back one. So it's exactly. All right, not bad. I'm getting a little bit of an artifact here because of the way that the body is in the Z space in correlation to the wing. So how do we fix that? 
Um, and we'll adjust the timing here in a second, but let's address this issue that I see right now. Um, we, we can add a camera inside of After Effects like we have in Cinema 40. You're going to right click down here in your timeline and you're going to go to new and you're going to hit camera and you're just going to default, you're going to select OK. And what that's going to do is it's going to put you in the view of a camera. Now, if you hit, I believe the shortcut is, oh, what is the orbit shortcut? It's shift, oh, okay. If I hold down shift and click one, I can orbit that camera around. If I hit shift and click two, I can, if I hold shift and two, I can move the camera around. It's not moving my object, it's moving the camera. And then if I hold shift and click three, what it's doing is it's zooming in and out of my, of the space there. So I'm going to hold down because I want to orbit and I want to see, you're going to notice that when I turn it, and this is why it's called 2.5D, right? Because in 3D, we have a third dimension. There's, there's, um, depth to the object, but in After Effects, you're not getting depth to the object. It is just faking that, right? It's faking that. So when I turn it too far, when I hold that shift and hit, hold, click one and move my mouse, right? Sh hold down shift. You then hold down one, two, or three. You click with your mouse and then you drag around the screen. And that's how you, that's how you move around. But when you do that, you notice that the, that if I have it directly facing at the camera or the camera directly facing at the object, that the body of the butterfly and the wing are on the same exact plane. Same with the antenna. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that body and I'm actually going to push it back in space a little bit more. So I'm going to bring up the position value here. Notice that there's three different position values. And if you want to push anything back in space or bring something forward in space, you always animate your Z parameter or you move your Z parameter. Remember X, Y, and Z. And when you look at this, you know, X is the red, Y is the green, Z is the blue. And so I'm going to bring that not forward, but back a little bit. And then as soon as I rotate the camera, oops, wrong, exit that, shift one, dr click drag, you're going to notice that the body and the wing are in separate Z spaces. Their Z value is different. And that's going to add a little bit of depth. That's something that you're going to do when you create the parallax on the mountain scene um, in the background. Because you'll notice that when this scene, when you play back this scene, if you look at the background, or if I slowly scrub through it, you can see that these mountains move forward and that the, the clouds are moving. The clouds are changing position value from, you know, left to right or right or left. And then the only thing that these mountains are doing is these have, um, a th they've been, the layer has been made a 3D layer, and then it's just an animation of the Z position in space. And it's a slow moving animation, right? But then notice, as soon as I start moving this, everything's, the, the wing flap is still there, right? And so in order to get back to my regular view, I'm just gonna select that camera and delete it. Um, notice that I have a null here. This was just to, I had, select all this. this is just a quickly change size of my butterfly um, when I had brought it in. You don't have to worry about that. I'm just going to delete that on there. It was just a quick controller I made to evenly scale the entire thing. All right, so uh, we did the wing flap there. Let's make this, let's first of all change the timing of that wing flap. And we're going to just finish this one. We might go over a few minutes, but I really want to get this, this part in. Uh, we're going to select the wing flap, and we're gonna, or the wing, and we're going to select U. And then we're going to take these. We're just going to tighten up that, the timing of this. We want it to happen a lot faster, so I'm actually going to cut everything. Control-Z, holding down Alt. I'm going to move everything down so that it is every 12 frames, 12 frame. Sometimes it's just easier to do this or to do it right the first time, which I can't do for some reason. So I'm going to select that and select 
these ones and scoot them over. You guys are realizing why Ooh, animation just can take a long time. 12 frames. I should have done this the first time. I don't know why I didn't. I'm going to move this. Remember to... Oh, that was an accidental click. But remembering to keep the last and the first keyframe the exact same values. All right. Now remember how in Cinema 4D, in order to create that looping or repeating animation, let me view this first. In fact, this could go faster. So when you guys do this, cut this in half. Every six frames, I would keyframe it like that. I'm just going to click and drag it, alt drag, even though it's not going to be perfect, and I'm going to drag it to about that. That's a little bit better. Um, but I want this to loop without having to copy and paste and copy and paste and copy and paste all of these keyframes. And so we're going to do something inside of After Effects, and it's called an expression. Whoop. Now, what is an expression? Let me ah get out of here real quick. I have a great definition written down that I want to that I like a shortcut. So um, an expression is essentially JavaScript code that you can plug into an animated property and it tells you to do a specific action or a specific thing. There are tons of different expressions to use. You don't have to know extensive coding or really coding much of it. It is good to know a little coding language, but After Effects has a bunch of them built into the software, so you don't actually have to know the language. Making sure, by the way, to save your project as you go. But the way that you add an expression onto any animated parameter is you go to this and you hold down Alt and then you click on the time, the stopwatch. What it does is all of a sudden this value will turn red and you'll see this little section add called expression Y rotation. You do not have to type in anything here. What you do is you click on this little arrow right here and you're going to go to, I think it is under, let me see here, I think it's under property. Yes. Property, loop out. Don't do loop out duration. Don't do this. Don't do this one. Don't do looping in. You're going to use looping out. That means that after your last keyframe, it is going to continuously repeat this section of keyframes over and over and over again. So if I play it, it's just going to continue flapping and flapping and flapping. And so that's a really short way, a really quick way, to have a repeated animation inside of After Effects. Now, similar to Cinema 4D, whatever changes you make here, they will be applied to the rest of the loop. So I need to, if I needed to tighten this, um, if I needed to tighten the timing up, I could do that and it would change it. Or, for instance, if I need to ease these. So I'm going to select all of the keyframes. I am going to go into the graph editor. I'm going to select them all like this then. And then I'm going to click Easy Ease. And I'm just going to drag these top ones holding down Shift. I'm going to drag these out a little bit to add more of an exaggerated ease. And then it's going to not only ease the flaps, but it's also going to ease them throughout the rest of the animation. Now, I think that's a little bit too dramatic, so I'm going to Shift Hold and bring that out a little bit so it's a little bit Let's see if I like that or if I want to go back the other way. Now, that's a little too chunky, right? A butterfly wing animation is pretty smooth, so I'm going to hit Z, Z. I'm going to check out the default of it. The default isn't bad. Um, I, I'm just bringing out a hair. Holding down Shift. Holding down... Oop, don't do that. Make sure you select that bar, hold down Shift, and move out slightly. There we go. Right? Not bad. Not bad for our first swing. Well, 
Um, obviously, you want it faster than that. That's a little sluggish for my taste. But we want to, let's duplicate this wing to make the second wing, right? Why do all the extra work when we have all the work here? And that other wing is going to just be the same exact thing. So go all the way to the beginning of the timeline. Let's go back into our dope sheet view. And I am going to hit Control D, and I'm going to duplicate that wing. I'm going to hide this one here so you guys just don't have to see it at all. Shy that layer. Same with this. Is it this one? Same with this one right there. I'm going to shy that layer so you guys don't have to see it's clutter. So now I have the third wing, which is technically the second one. And I want to move that back in Z space as well um, so that it's on the other side of the, of the body of the butterfly. But I don't want to add another camera and do that. So there's another way that you can see the views inside of After Effects. When you have your 3D layers turned on, it will automatically turn into a 3D rendering engine for After Effects. This shows that you are looking through the active camera, which we don't actually have a camera, but it just says camera. We want to go under here and we want to view this in two different views. So this will not only view it ahead, but then if I take this, this one right here, and I change it to, let's say, the top view. Now it's looking at the layers. I know they look really thin, but here, if I select the first wing, you can see that by the selection in the little vertices here, the outline, right, the composition frame, I'll call it, um, you can see which layer is where. And you can, I believe you can change, you can look at three different views, but here is where you're going to change which view you're looking at. You can do a custom view, which would, you would use that, you would hold down the shift and you could rotate it and orbit it this way. So you can see where the body is and where the wing is. And we're going to select that, we're going to do that. We're going to move this like here and have a kind of custom view. And we're going to select that second wing. We're going to hit P and we're going to bring that position back. So I'm just going to click the Z position and move it right there. So they're about equal. And then I'm just going to, when I click, whoop, we're going opposite there. I'll show you how to fix that here in just a second. Let me go. Let's do that real quick now. So hit, we want to bring up the rotation value because that is where it is rotating in the correct, incorrect direction. We need it to flap the other way. I'm going to go back into single view. Or no, I'll do it this view. It's actually a little easier that way. I'm going to select select my selection tool up at the top and um, you can do this two ways you can either go into the graph editor and before you ease these you can take these keyframes right here and turn them into a negative value or you can go into the dope sheet view and you can move your you're going to want to do this before you do the timing too because you want them to be directly on a an actual frame and not in between like it shouldn't be. So I'm gonna do this, grab these, just move them so that they are on a frame, first of all. There we go. Make sure I'm not missing any. Okay, cool. Now they're all specifically on a frame in time. Um, and I'm just gonna change this value to opposite of what it is on the first wing, right? So it's 76 there, I need to change it to negative 76. Here. and it should work in theory there we go and then I'm going to go not to this keyframe but to the next keyframe because that's where the second change happens and instead of 55 I'm going to type in negative 55 and so if I play this back you'll see in both this view and this view I have flapping wings the issue here well let's look at this view and then play it oh come on you're going to do this to me now there we go. It's flapping when I manually scrub through. The only thing is that you can't really see that wing behind. So I'm going to go into the orientation of the second wing. And I'm going to change it. Nope, not that way. Nope, not that way. I'm going to change that Z orientation. So it's slightly forward or slightly back. Let's do it slightly forward a little bit there. And that way... 
you can see that the wings are flapping. You can also Ooh, let's see if uh, what's a better way to do this because I'm not sure I don't don't change the orientation of that one put it back at 300 not at 30 fingers work today I'm gonna rotate the we want it to rotate this way right a little bit so that we can see it so that would technically be the x value the x rotation and since we don't have that animated oop, not that one i'm sorry it would be the y or the z since we don't have that one animated i can move that one back and forth a little bit and get a little bit of that change there the other thing that i recommend you guys doing is when you're animating Flaps of wings. Let me see. Let's um, let's offset the sink. Let's offset these right, these keyframes, so that we can see the wing in the back flapping just slightly at a different time. So I'm just going to select those keyframes and move them forward. In this case, you do not want to move the layer because if you do that, notice that the, all of a sudden the layer disappears or the, the actual second wing disappears. If you do decide to do this, you just take this layer and extend it. And then it will just show back up and then you'll still have the animation. This is offset too much because I not only offset the keyframes, but I offset the actual layer. And that's a little bit too much. I would only maybe offset it by one keyframe. There we go, that looks better. A little bit more interesting. I would still mess around with my um, values here. I think they're happening. I think they're a little too jerky. So I would honestly mess around more with the curves to try and figure out, to try and make it look a little bit different. Let's um, move these ones in a little bit. And these ones in a little bit. Holding down shift. So it's just kind of a quicker... There we go. That looks really smooth um, when they're like that. But making sure that you change it on both of them, right? So we'll go to, we're going to select that value there. Of course, you're not going to show up in here for me. I'm going to go out of this view and then click back into it. Oh man, how did I, how do I change the, that, why is it not showing me the keyframes? There we go. I just had to tighten up my, um, I was just further down in the timeline. That's how you can see it. So I'm going to select these again. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here and I am going to take these bottom ones push them in holding shift a little bit there we go yeah that looks really natural like a nice soft like if it were landing on something right you'd want it a lot faster when they're flying in the air but if it were landed on something and just kind of flapping a little bit you can do that another way you know to sell that these flaps are happening quickly is adding that motion blur so just clicking that on and it sells that that's moving a little bit faster. If your wing flaps are that out of sync, I might not even offset these. Maybe just change the amount of, let me change it from two views to one view. And I would just maybe change the, um, the values so they're just slightly different. Maybe bring this one, like change this one to negative, I don't know, like 70 or something like that right so you can play around with that play around with your keyframes to make sure they're moving nice and smooth play around with the timing um the other thing that we want to do is we're going to start moving this where's my time i'm at okay i'm like five minutes over i'm going to tell you guys how to do something called parenting now parenting is when you link one or more layers to a single layer. So when I, the, the butterfly's flapping, that's all good. Let's, it's all, um, 
it's all in its own pre comp it's all in this monarch butterfly pre comp that i have here so i'm going to drag that into the main the main pre comp here and i'm going to or the main composition i'm going to shut off my paper plane that i made and um, in fact i am going to no we don't want to do that well that's what you'll do at, at, eventually when you want to do that when you want to bring it into your main composition no let's delete that we're going to do scratch what i said there uh we want to we want to move this butterfly inside of this composition but as soon as like what what's going to lead the butterfly it's going to be the body right but as soon as i start to move this body it doesn't move the rest of the layers and so we have to link these wings and this antenna to the body so that when i move that body the rest of the layers go with it oh, let me hit c again and so that is essentially what parenting is there's two ways to do it right we want to link the wings and the antenna to this layer specifically here so you can either select all of the layers that you want to parent to the body and you can do one of two things you can grab this little thing here. This is called a pick whip. And you can click and drag it and just like let it go on the layer that you want it to sit on. Or you can click this little drop down menu and you can select which one you want it to be parented to, which would be the body, right? Um, the other way, let me show you the pick whip way. This is what most people use. Is you click on this pick whip and you drag it to the layer you want it to parent to and then you just let it go and notice this all changes. And then once I grab the position of this butterfly and move it, it moves across my screen, up and down, over, left and right. And then even if I wanted it back and forth, it could do that, right, in Z space. And so let's really quickly just add this to a path. So I'm gonna just grab my pen tool. I'm gonna create a quick path here. I'm going to take off, I'm actually going to, we don't want the, we don't want to see the path line on this one, right? So I am going to do this. I'm going to go down in here into the contents, into the shape, and I'm going to select the path directly on the path, not on the path folder. And I'm just going to hit control C and then I'm going to go to the position of the body and I'm going to hit control V. It should have worked that way. Let me see. Yes, it did. If it's not working this way for some reason, make sure or the make sure that this path layer is 3D as well. But this seemed to work just fine. So I'm going to just delete that path. And notice because remember I pasted it to the pos position value of this, it um it still in the I pasted the path values to the position of the body. Um, it is still there even though the actual path layer is not. And then it's not going in the correct way, so I'm going to right-click, keyframe assistant, time reverse those keyframes, and then all of a sudden I have a butterfly flying across the screen. Make sure you auto-orient it. So again, that is right-clicking the layer, going up to transform, or hitting and clicking auto-orient, or click on this and hit control alt o orient along path not towards the camera don't do that just towards the path on the path you want to select that Ooh, we're in a different this is a great reason why we should possibly do this in one of two ways you can fix this by going into the orientation of the body. Let's go down here. Let's just hit O, R, so it brings up the rotation. And then we're gonna rotate the X value. Let me click my selection tool there. Select my selection tool. And in the X value, nope, wrong one. X value, there we go. We can face it 90 degrees exactly, right? Because that's gonna, rotate it perfectly and then there we go the other way you could do it is pre-compose your entire butterfly and then inside it with that pre-comp you would essentially put the you would 
paste that path into the position of the pre-composition. But that might not end up, you're, you're, the problem is, is that the butterfly is going to, no, you could do that. Uh, so let's do it that way too, real quick. Let us go to position and I'm going to delete these keyframes right there. And then I'm going to go back into, I'm going to zero out this position. So it's, uh, well, actually, remember what I said earlier, half of 10, 1920 by 1080 is 960 by 540. It's going to bring that in the middle. I'm going to hit R to bring up the orientation. I'm going to zero that out again so that it is facing in the correct direction. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to pre-compose all of this, which it already is. And like I said, I'll bring it into this layer. And then I'm going to draw the path in here. Click, drag, click, drag, click, drag, click, drag. And I'm going to type in path in the search bar. Select that path. Copy that path. Go into the position of the butterfly. Remembering that I want this, I want this to where I want the butterfly to be moved, right? The anchor point. And then I am going to copy it into there. Let me see if it worked. Select that, hit Control V, and we'll play it this way. All right, it works that way too. So you guys can either pre-compose it or you can put the path on the body of the butterfly. Um, and then you would just delete this layer right there and auto-orient and do all the rest of the stuff. And then you have another butterfly. You can duplicate that butterfly. You can, um, let me have the, you can offset that butterfly. You can scale this butterfly down, scaling it down, right? So it looks small. And then I'm gonna hit the P for position. I'm gonna select that position and I'm gonna move this one so that it's a, a different spot. Ooh, but I still want that path. I want that entire path to be, you don't want the butterfly to get cut off. So you want to make sure that the beginning and the end of your path are off the screen so that the entire butterfly goes off the screen. And then what we'll do is we'll just offset this a little bit more there and we'll just play, play this, right? Except obviously you would change the orientation and and the, the timing a little bit more and you can update the path of this one specifically, but... That is essentially how you create that kaleidoscope effect of the butterflies. And then by animating the Z space of your, your mountain layers, remember, whatever you want to animate has to be on a separate layer. So when you're illustrating that, make sure your clouds are on a separate layer, each one of them. Make sure that your mountains, whatever you want to animate separately, is on a separate layer. Same if you wanted to do the sun setting or rising slowly. You can do that, right? And then we're going to, um, and then you're going to make it a 3D layer like this, same exact concept. And then you're gonna animate it. You're gonna animate, instead of the rotation of the mountains, like you did for the wings, you're gonna animate the Z, the Z position of that. These ones, uh, the clouds in particular, don't necessarily have to be uh, a 3D scene, but I suggest doing that so they're behind all the butterflies or offset back in your Z space. You can do it that way if you want. But when you set up an object and it looks like this, let's do the top view. When you have multiple layers and they're set in your Z space back like this, this is essentially what you do to parallax, right? When they used to animate, let me put myself back on the screen. When they used to animate the old Disney videos, they used to have glass plates that they would stack on top of each other or that they would have in like a, a machine thing. And then what they would do is each one of those glass plates would have something separate painted on it. For instance, if we were looking at this one and we were doing it old school Disney style, the like obviously I said the butterflies would be on a separate plate. The clouds would be on a separate plate. Same with the mountains. And then like as the the cloud plates are moving like this, then the mountain plate would move up like this and the butterflies would move across like this because everything would be on its own separate plate. That is called a parallax effect. When they're all set in di a different space, right? They're all in different spaces, Z space or whatever. And then they're moving at different 
at different speeds at different times, that is a parallax effect. And that gives this, the, this perception of 3D space. And that's also what 2.5D is. And so I want you to apply these effects when you're doing this. Also, when you're in this scene right here, right? This butterfly one, obviously we have this whole entire thing, which is pre-comped, scaling up and the butterfly wings are flapping. It's just the the butterfly is in a different position. It's the top down. So you're gonna animate the wing flap like that. And then right here, what we see is the, as this is this starts to scale up, the entire pre-composition of the butterfly with the circle is scaling upwards and changing the transparency from 100 to 0%, and that one is going to reveal the bottom the bottom scene, or the second second scene here, where these icons, right? You can use these pre-comps over again. You can use them over as many times as you want. And you're gonna take that pre-comp and you're going to scale it up, and then you're gonna animate that pre-comp along the path, because if you notice, the butterfly wings are flapping there. So you only have to make one composition of this butterfly in a circle flapping its wings. And then from that comp pre-composition folder is where you're going to animate that one specifically here. And then you're going to animate the pre-composition folder specifically here as well. So that pre-comp is going to scale up. It's going to pop on screen. It is going to have a tail following or path following it. It's going to animate along a path down to, down to where Central America is. And then it's also then you're going to have a circle expanding to reveal this scene here where you have the path animations of the butterflies, the kaleidoscope of them sequencing, right? So all in all, that's how to do it. I You guys need to watch. Let me go to, let me open a new thing real quick here because I need to end this. It's gone over long enough. Um inside of canvas let me do this off screen real quick pull up the module if you want when putting it together go into the student view okay um, you will want to watch so this video is on how to draw them this video here is about the looping animation and the paths that we talked about today. This one is about creating the background uh, for the flight. And this one is animating the butterflies in flight. This one is, um, this one's the one you're really going to want to watch is putting it all together in, with the, and working with the audio. So you guys want to add that. If you guys animate some grass, if you want to, you can add that in there. Um, it can be extra credit. I'll add an extra 10 points on there. And then what I'm going to do, because this lesson went over a little bit, and because um, next week is a week before spring break, I want you guys to work on this and, you know, take your time on this. So I'm going to extend the due date from... When do I have it? I have it Monday at 11, but I think I'm going to change it to, which is the 6th, I'm going to change it to the 8th. So we will spend next class, you know what, um, no, we're going to spend next class putting it to music real quick and then going over the thing. Um, so yeah, I'm going to change it to the 8th for due date because we're going to go over just a little bit more on Tuesday, but I would get a head start on this because this is a heavy project because you're going to be illustrating and animating. So with that being said, I'm going to end the class here. I know it's been a long time. I really appreciate you guys staying later. I wanted to kind of get all this done for you. Um, and with that being said, I will talk to you all next week. I hope you guys have a good weekend and...